Audiobook Summary of Outliers, The Story of Success by Malcolm Gladwell. Unlock the secrets to success and join the ranks of the extraordinary with this inspiring book summary. Discover how opportunity, upbringing, and culture can shape your path to greatness and learn the importance of putting in 10,000 hours of practice to master your craft. With the knowledge and insights gained from this book, you too can become an outlier and achieve the success you've always dreamed of. Don't miss out on the chance to unlock your full potential. Have you ever wondered what sets successful people apart from the rest of us? They're called outliers for a reason. They've achieved more than the average person, standing out from the crowd with their unique talents and abilities. From business tycoons to rock stars, athletes to billionaires, Outliers come in all shapes and sizes. But how do they do it? While we're often inspired by rags to riches stories and the tales of self made individuals, there's a bigger picture to consider. The traditional view of success as a purely personal achievement ignores the role that upbringing, culture, and society can play in shaping an individual's path to success. So, let's take a closer look at the stories of outliers to understand the full picture. By examining the factors that contribute to their success, from their upbringing to the people who helped them along the way, we'll gain a new perspective on what it takes to truly excel. Are you ready to explore the secrets of success with a fresh perspective? Let's dive in. Hockey in Canada Hockey is practically a national obsession in Canada, with boys learning to play the game from a very young age. But have you ever stopped to wonder how the best players make it to the national team? Well, here's a surprising fact, the month you're born in can actually make a big difference. Turns out, coaches tend to favor boys who are older in their class. So, a boy born in December might not make the cut while someone born in January or February has a better chance of getting selected. Why? Simply put, the older boys are usually more physically mature, with a noticeable difference in their body structures compared to younger classmates. From the ages of 9 to 10, the chosen boys get intensive training from their coach and practice three times more than average. By their teenage years, they're already experts at the game and ready to move up to the big leagues. But what about the kids born later in the year? It's not just in hockey this age-based selection process happens in other sports too, and even at the Olympics. We often overlook the talents of younger athletes, dismissing them as not good enough. But if given the same opportunities, who knows what they could achieve? It's a reminder that success isn't just about individual achievement. Society plays a role in determining who gets the chance to excel and who doesn't. So, let's give everyone a fair shot and see what incredible things they can achieve. Who knows, the next big outlier could be hiding in plain sight. The 10,000th hour. Practicing isn't something you do after you're good. It's what you do that makes you good. In the 1990s, psychologists conducted a study at the Academy of Music in Berlin. It is important for them to know how much talent and practice determine success. Violinists excel because of their innate talent? Is it a result of practice? The psychologists observed that students become better at playing violin as they practice more. Children spend more time practicing as they grow older. Thousands of hours have already been spent practicing by the best violinists by the time they are 20 years old. A similar study was conducted on pianists. Since childhood, amateurs have only spent 2,000 hours playing. Professionals, however, increased their practice hours every year. They have played for a total of 10,000 hours by the time they are 20 years old. According to the psychologists, there are no naturals. It is impossible for a musician to become the best by practicing less. It takes 10,000 hours to become a world-class in anything. 
This magic number has been proven in other studies. It takes 10,000 hours to become a mastermind, whether you're a musician, an athlete, a writer, or a criminal mastermind. Expertise and mastery require 10,000 hours in our brains. However, not everyone can afford to spend 10,000 hours. It cannot be achieved on your own. It is important to have supportive parents when you are a child. Adults need spare time. When you are poor and have to work, you won't have time to practice. It is an extraordinary opportunity to have 10,000 hours at your disposal. Consider Bill Gates as an example. Programming has been a part of his life since he was in 8th grade. It was a special opportunity because it was in the 1960s. The only people who could afford a computer at that time were the rich. Bill Gates' father is a lawyer, while his mother comes from a rich family. He was enrolled in an elite school in Seattle called Lakeside. In 1968, it was one of the few schools with a computer club. Bill Gates practiced programming nonstop from 8th grade through high school. When Bill Gates dropped out of college to start Microsoft, he had already spent more than 10,000 hours working on it. Besides being a brilliant programmer, he is also an entrepreneur. Nevertheless, Bill Gates took advantage of that unusual opportunity. I was very lucky, said Bill Gates. It takes a special opportunity to be an outlier. That lucky break needs to come your way. An extraordinary talent requires an extraordinary opportunity to succeed. The Beatles During the unveiling of the statue of Benjamin Franklin, Robert Winthrop said, Lift up your heads and view the image of a man who rose from nothing, who owed nothing to parentage or patronage. Do outliers really rise from nothing? We are obsessed with autobiographies of successful people. All of them had humble beginnings. However, they overcame every challenge and succeeded. It was a result of their own unique abilities. The truth is that great leaders like Franklin benefit from opportunities and advantages. Outliers owe their success to their parents, patrons, and communities. This is due to the legacies and culture of their ancestors. It is not enough to study a person's qualities if we want to know how he succeeded. He should also tell us when and where he grew up. Let's take the Beatles as an example. Hamburg, Germany was their special opportunity before they became popular. The year was 1960. In those days, the Beatles were only a high school band. There were many strip clubs in Hamburg at that time. To attract more customers, rock bands were invited. There was a club in Liverpool, England called Bruno that always featured bands from Liverpool. For hours on end, Philip Norman wanted the bands to play non-stop. John Lennon said about their experience in Hamburg, We got better and gained more confidence. We had to try harder, put our heart and soul into it, and get over it. Every night, the Beatles played in Hamburg clubs for eight hours straight. Their creativity, stamina, and discipline were developed. In Liverpool, they would only play the same songs for an hour. The Beatles played a different version of the song in Hamburg, however. For eight hours, they performed rock and jazz. In only 18 months, the Beatles performed in Hamburg 270 times. The band had already played live 1,200 times when they became popular in 1964. They stood out from all the other rock and roll bands because of that. With a live audience, they practiced a lot. Hamburg was a special opportunity for the Beatles. They benefited from the culture and community of Hamburg, Germany. They were no good on stage when they went there, but very good when they returned they sounded like no one else. It made them. Morgan, Carnegie, and Rockefeller. A list of the 75 wealthiest people in history has been compiled by historians. They began with the pharaohs and Cleopatra. 
from all over the world, they sought out the richest people. Only 20% of them came from only one generation in America. The list included Andrew Carnegie. He was born in 1835. J.P. Morgan was born in 1837 while John Rockefeller was born in 1839. Out of the 75, there are 11 other Americans. All of them were born between 1830 and 1840. All of them are incredibly rich, could it be a mere coincidence? Why might this be happening? From the 1860s to the 1870s, the American economy underwent its biggest transformation. The era of Wall Street development was during this time. Steel was manufactured and railroads were built. The American economy shifted from a traditional to a modern one. These outliers on the wealthiest list were all at the right age for this economic boom. People born in the 1840s are too young. People born in the 1820s are too old. Carnegie, Morgan, and Rockefeller were all the right age. As a result of their country's economic growth, they became beneficiaries. There is talent and vision in these wealthy men. However, they also had that special opportunity, just like the hockey players. As a result, they dominated the world of finance and steel. It was the right place and the right time for them to be born. Microsoft founder Bill Gates and Apple founder Steve Jobs. Take a look at Silicon Valley's outliers. 1975 was the year when they were given a special opportunity. The Altair 8800 was released at that time. Older computer models were expensive and large. However, Altair 8800 only costs $397. It can be assembled at home and used. It can be owned by anyone. 1975 marked the beginning of the era of personal computers. If you are too old or too young at the time, you will not be able to take advantage of this special opportunity. If you were born after 1958, you are still in high school. If you were born before 1952, you probably already work for IBM. IBM had already established itself in Silicon Valley by 1975. By producing mainframe computers, it earns billions of dollars. Those who are old enough to work are already there. It's already a nice living for them. However, they belong to the old paradigm. The opportunity was not available to them. Around 1955 is the right age for the personal computer revolution. In 1975, this generation was just out of college. They were able to explore the possibilities of the modern computer. What are the names of the software billionaires born in 1955? On October 28, 1955, Bill Gates was born. Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen was born on January 21, 1956. Together, they studied at Lakeside. Lakeside Computer Club members and best friends. On February 24, 1955, Steve Jobs was born. Unlike Gates, Jobs did not come from a wealthy family. His parents adopted him. However, he was raised in Mountain View, California. Silicon Valley's epicenter. The neighborhood Jobs grew up in was filled with Hewlett Packard engineers. HP scientists hosted forums for him. He bought electronic spare parts at flea markets in Mountain View. He found Bill Hewlett's number in the phone book when he was 12 years old. To get spare parts, he called HP's co-founder. The parts were not the only thing Jobs acquired. HP offered him a summer job. Not all business tycoons in the U.S. were born in 1955 and the 1830s. However, there is a trend in their stories. As a result of our focus on individual achievement, we failed to notice the pattern. It was a special opportunity for these successful people. They took advantage of it and made the most of it. 
They were born during a time when hard work was rewarded by society. Their achievements were not solely the result of their own efforts. Their success was greatly influenced by the world in which they grew up. Math and Asians What makes Asians so good at math? There are many possible answers to this question. Nevertheless, something deeply ingrained in their culture is difficult to guess. As a result of their cultural heritage, Asians are outliers in math. Their number naming and counting systems are logical. Chinese number words are very short. 7 is qi and 4 is si. They are 7 and 4 in English. Chinese numbers are easier to memorize because they are shorter. It is easier to pronounce them. In English, we count 11, 12, and 13. Why do we say 16, 17, and 18, but not 15, 16, and 17? It's just 10 1 for 11, 10 2 for 12, 2 10s for 20, and 2 10s 1 for 21 for Chinese, Japanese, and Koreans. Number names in English are irregular. For Asians, however, numbers are simpler and easier to add. In order to solve 37 plus 22, an English first grader must first convert 37 and 22 to numbers. For Asians, however, adding 3 10 7 plus 2 10 2 is faster. There is already an equation. 5 10 9 is the answer. It is easy to understand the Asian number system. Compared to Western children, Asian children are better at counting, memorizing, and calculating. Fractions are even easier to understand. Three-fifths is three-fifths in English. It is said in Chinese, out of five parts, take three. A small child can figure out the fraction from the words. There is already a distinction between the numerator and the denominator. The decade comes first in English for numbers such as 21, 22, and 23. As in 14, 15, and 16, the unit number comes first for teens. Western children are disenchanted from an early age. Math does not seem to make sense, it has a clumsy linguistic structure, and its basic rules seem arbitrary and complex. As a result of the simple and logical number system, Asian children can enjoy learning math. It is easier and faster for them to solve problems. Numbers themselves provide the advantage. It is easy to assume that Asians are simply talented at math. According to the differences between the number systems in the East and the West, being good at math may also be rooted in a group's culture. The Rice Paddies Rice has been cultivated by the Chinese for thousands of years. Other Asian countries also learned their technique for cultivating rice. Rice cultivation is a tedious process. The process isn't like plow wheat, where you just have to clear the field. Rice paddies must be built by the farmers. There must be enough water supply for the rice paddy. Irrigation channels and dikes are made by the farmers. Rice seedlings will be planted on soft mud. The Chinese use human manure and other organic materials as fertilizer. The cultivation of rice is a family affair. There would be help from the farmer's family, relatives, and friends. Rice seedlings would be carefully planted by them. As soon as the rice is ripe, they would all harvest it together. There is only a small rice paddy. The size of the room is similar to that of a hotel room. There could be two or three rice paddies on one farm. A Chinese village can sustain itself on 450 acres of land. One family owns 450 acres in America. There is a striking difference between Western and Eastern agriculture. There are a lot of farms in Midwestern America. The reason for this is that they use machines. Human effort is reduced. However, the machines enable farmers to produce more crops. 
There is no equipment available to the Chinese and other Asians. In order to increase their yield, they invest more time and effort. Rice paddy is small, but farmers use it diligently. Rice quality is ensured by them. Farmers must work harder in order to produce more crops. Furthermore, European farmers are idle during the winter. Due to their inability to plant, they spend most of their time sleeping. During the 19th century, a historian wrote that peasant life in France was essentially brief episodes of work followed by long periods of idleness. Meanwhile, Chinese farmers never stop working. During the dry season, they make and sell bamboo hats and baskets. Rice patties are repaired. Tofu and dried bean curd are made there. When it's not farming season, the Chinese pursue other livelihoods. Spring will bring the Chinese farmer back to his fields early in the morning. Planting rice is 20 times harder than planting corn or wheat. Every year, the Chinese farmer works 3,000 hours in the rice paddies. Chinese proverbs reflect the hard work of farmers. The lazy man freezes to death in winter. Don't depend on heaven for food, but on your own two hands carrying the load. In contrast to the Russian proverb, Eastern agriculture is more diligent and practical. Rice paddies symbolize Asian hard work. They were unconquered by poverty and nature. Their culture values hard work. Everywhere they go, they bring this quality with them. Final thoughts. Success is not just about having talent. It's about creating opportunities and taking advantage of them. Your upbringing plays a crucial role in shaping who you are and what you can achieve, but that doesn't mean you can't be an outlier. You can harness your unique qualities and behaviors, and with hard work and dedication, you can rise above the rest. So don't wait for success to come to you, go out and make it happen. Take control of your life, pursue your passions, and become the outlier that you were meant to be. Hope you enjoyed this book summary, do not forget to subscribe to our channel for more audiobook summary.